Good morning and good afternoon to our viewers in the United States, the Central African Republic, Chad, and around the world. My name is Elizabeth Murray and, behalf, and on behalf of the United States Institute of Peace and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, I am honored to welcome you today. Our event, Hate Speech and Atrocity Risks in Central Africa, Lessons from Central African Republic and Chad is being streamed in both English and French on USIP's website. With the development and spread of new forms of communication, hate speech has become a more serious and widespread issue globally over the past decade. In the Central Africa region, hate speech carries consequences for social cohesion and for citizen security. Hate speech is shared in a variety of methods in private conversations, in public forums, in print, online, radio, and in other forums. And it targets many groups, including youth, women, ethnic or religious communities, people of different political identities, members of the LGBTQ community, persons with disabilities, and other groups. The specific triggers for hate speech are, are also quite varied. These include national political milestones, such as Chad's 2022 National Dialogue, and the constitutional referendum that will be held in the Central African Republic later this month. Beyond national politics, incidents of local violence can trigger hate speech, as can conflicts over resources. Hate speech can even be triggered by a simple and completely unfounded rumor. Truly, the range of circumstances that can give rise to hate speech is enormous, and that is why this issue requires our collective attention and our collective vigilance. I'd like to say a few words about the relationship between hate speech and disinformation, which is another important issue in Central Africa and around the world. Hate speech is distinct, but can be related to disinformation, which is the deliberate spread of incorrect and misleading information. Hateful language can be part of a disinformation campaign, and disinformation can also lead to hate speech. When that disinformation is believed by other individuals, those individuals can then spread the information as misinformation, and the misinformation can contain hate speech or contribute, or can contribute to an increase in hate speech. The overall political and conflict trends in the Central African Republic and Chad call for focused peacebuilding efforts and particular vigilance around rising hate speech. In Chad, the fragile political transition, a controversial national dialogue last year, and a violent crackdown on protesters last October have all contributed to rising political tensions. And at the same time, in the south of Chad, violence has risen between herders and farmers and between other communities. This often breaks down on ethnic and religious lines, making this a fertile breeding ground for hate speech. In the Central African Republic, the anticipated constitutional referendum this month to lift presidential term limits has greatly exacerbated political tensions across the country. And at the same time, Armed groups continue to fight one another and carry out violence against civilians across large swaths of the country. This protracted and very complex conflict in the Central African Republic has also seen a rise in the involvement of external actors over the past five years. Amidst these dynamics, recent analysis by the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's, Museum's Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide and Dartmouth College shows that atrocity risks are significant in the region. Specifically, in a statistical risk assessment for the risk of mass killing, Chad is ranked fourth in the world and the Central African Republic is ranked 16th. We are very fortunate that our colleague, Dr. Ashley Lando from the museum is here today with us to brief us on this important research and to help us to understand the links between hate speech and the risk of violence. We are also delighted to have our partners from the region with us, specifically Mr. José Nagatondang Zolang of the organization Association Jeunesse en Marche pour le Développement en Centrafrique, known by its acronym AGEMADEC, 
and Dr. Yaminge Betinbay of the Centre de Recherche en Anthropologie et Sciences Humaines, known by its acronym CRASH. They will help us understand trends in hate speech in the region, specifically, what issues are the subject of hate speech? How are different actors contributing to hate speech? And at the same time, how are other actors working to counter hate speech? Our partners are very well versed in the nuanced work of countering hate speech while upholding the importance of free speech at the same time. In short, their work is empowering citizens to claim their right to free speech, but to use it responsibly to build peace in their communities. Understanding trends in hate speech is important because it offers us opportunities to intervene and to prevent violence and to reduce tensions. USIP has a long history of working to address hate speech in our many regional and thematic programs around the world. In the Central Africa region specifically, hate speech has been a central focus of our work since 2020. Our partners in the region are at the forefront of efforts to train citizens, communities, and media on how to address and respond to hate speech. We've partnered with Ajemadek and the Peace Tech Lab on the development of a lexicon of hate speech and inflammatory language in the Central African Republic. And since 2020, we've worked with Ajemadek as they have carried out a variety of efforts to train and mentor local leaders, bloggers, national political party figures, and others to respond and counter hate speech. Recently, beginning in 2022, we've partnered with Crash in Chad to support constructive citizen and media <laughs> engagement in the political transition and the mapping of hate speech on social media. Crash has recently become involved in regional coordination on tackling hate speech and disinformation. In fact, just a few months ago, they convened a seminar in Southern Chad involving not only Chadian civil society, but also counterparts from the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of the Congo to discuss this important issue. At USIP, <coughs> we are so pleased to partner with these two organizations that are carrying out such innovative and important work. Today's event should be considered a first conversation. We are glad that you are here and we hope that you will join us for our second conversation later this year. Today's conversation is meant to articulate the links between hate speech and atrocity risk. We hope that we will all come out with a better understanding of when hate speech may be an indicator or a driver of violence. We also hope that this can lead us towards stronger locally led prevention and peace building efforts. In the fall, our second event will focus on policy responses to hate speech. These two events will mainly focus on lessons from Chad and the Central African Republic, but this issue goes well beyond. It affects the region, specifically the neighbor to the South, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, other neighboring countries, indeed the entire continent and the entire world. So we hope that you'll join us, not just today, but also for our event in, our event in the fall. Again, we're pleased to co-host this event and this, indeed this series with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, given the museum's deep expertise and robust methodology on atrocity risks and prevention. Our event today will begin with interventions from our three panelists, followed by a moderated discussion and question and answer with the audience. During the question and answer, you'll be able to use the chat function on USIP's website to submit your questions in French or English. I will now turn the floor to my colleague, Archie Henry. Under Archie's leadership, our hate speech work and our program in Central Africa have grown tremendously over the past year, and he will moderate today's conversation. Archie, over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and hello, everyone. My name is Archibald Henry, and I'm a program officer for Central Africa and the Sahel at the United States Institute of Peace. I'm very pleased to present our panelists for today's discussion, starting with Dr. Ashley Landau. Um, Ashley is a research associate for the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide, where she is responsible for conducting quantitative and qualitative research on a wide range of issues related to atrocity prevention, with a primary focus on the center's early warning project. In graduate school, Ashley and her colleagues at the University of Oregon 
developed a tool to measure and assess patterns of exclusionary thinking that are associated with mass killing. She has worked with government officials, practitioners, and NGOs on these topics. She has an ongoing partnership with the Oxford Consortium for Human Rights and is a recurring speaker at their workshops. She has also co-directed and implemented large-scale conflict analysis simulations. Ashley has her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from St. Mary's College of California and her Master of Science and PhD in Social Psychology from the University of Oregon. Turning to Dr. Yaminge Betimbaye, Yaminge uh, is a Director of Research and Political Analyst at the Center for Research in Anthropology and Human Sciences, also known as CRASH, a Chadian think tank based in N'Djamena. Lecturer, researcher with the University of N'Djamena and the University of Mundu in Southern Chad, he holds a PhD in Human and Political Geography from the University of Ngaoundere, Cameroon. Journalist with a degree in information sciences from University of N'Djamena, he began his work as managing editor at the Chadian Press Agency. Currently, he is the focal point for CRASH for monitoring and analysis of the Chadian political transition process and regularly leads research on security and political dynamics in Chad in the region. He recently coordinated the study on mechanisms of hate speech content on social media in Chad, conducted by CRASH in coordination with the U.S. Institute of Peace. We also have with us uh, Mr. Rosan Ngatondang Zalang, who is the founder and president of Association Jeunesse En Marche pour le Développement en Centrafrique, also known as AGEMADEC, which he has led since its foundation in 2017. Mr. Ngatondang Zalang has become one of the opinion leaders and activists for peace, reconciliation, interreligious, and community dialogue in the Central African Republic. In 2023, he was awarded the Gold Medal of Labor by the Central African Order of Merit as the president and founder of the NGO Ajemadek. Rosan has also spoken at the United Nations Security Council on the situation in CAR and the mandate of the UN Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in the country, MINUSCA. Raised in a modest family in Western CAR and a member of an endangered minority ethnic group, Rosan was unable to attend University of Bangui. However, he became a self-taught individual in systematic botany, financial administration, and project management, as well as organizational leadership by taking a series of professional trainings. Rosan began his professional career as a researcher in ethnobotany, then as financial administrator, and then working in development and humanitarian projects. We're very pleased to have uh, this, this excellent panel with us today and to a very rich discussion. As a reminder, we'll have initial remarks uh, from our panelists, and then we'll go to a moderated discussion followed by a Q&A, um, and where participants will, will continue to ask questions in the chats, and the chat function is, is currently open, as you can see on the USIP website page. Um, I'll, I'd like to start uh, by turning it to um, Ashley, um, for introductory remarks. Um, Ashley, it's a great pleasure to, to have you with us today. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit more uh, on the work of the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide related to atrocity risks and hate speech, maybe your take on, on the relationship between these two issues and uh, how these dynamics play out in Chad and Carr. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Archie, and thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's really uh, such a pleasure to be here today and to also be on the same panel as Yaminge and Rosan. It's a great honor. So I hope to answer some of those questions uh, that you've posed and simply provide some framing remarks that I hope will help to uh, frame and guide our discussion as well. So before I begin, uh, let me quickly give you some uh, brief background information on our organization. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum is an independent establishment of the U.S. government. The museum was created to really be a living memorial to the victims and the survivors of the Holocaust. But we were also created to be a catalyst for change, to take the rhetorical commitment to never again and translate that into genuine and sustained political action. 
The Simon Scott Centre for the Prevention of Genocide was formed to be a resource for governments and organisations working to help prevent and respond to genocide and related crimes against humanity. We strive really to disrupt systematic mass violence at every stage by identifying ways in which governments and institutions can intervene at the early warning signs of violence and calling for action before atrocities begin, by also mobilizing lawmakers and foreign policy leaders to take action to save lives when violence explodes, and also by promising, um, by promoting justice and accountability efforts for victim and survivor communities in situations where there is a history of atrocities, where there's ongoing atrocities, or a high risk of future violence. And so to help prevent mass atrocities, we really need to try to think through how they could plausibly occur and what dynamics create those risks. And I believe discussions like this um, help to do that. So when we're doing this work, we really are looking at a few different but related types of violence. And I thought it might be helpful to actually define some of those terms briefly for everyone. Likely the terms that uh, are familiar to most people are going to be genocide and crimes against humanity. Genocide is a legal term and is defined as a number of specified acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. We also look at crimes against humanity, which is also a legal concept, and they're defined as widespread and systematic criminal acts that grossly violate human rights. But we also often use the term mass atrocities. This is uh, not a legal term and doesn't have a legal definition, but it is a very useful term as it can as it can operate as an umbrella term that encompasses both genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as war crimes. And mass atrocities are defined as large scale systematic attacks on civilian populations. A mass atrocity can be perpetrated by a state, but it can also be perpetrated by non-state actors. And it can also occur in the context of armed conflict, as well as during peacetime. So now that we've discussed some of the important terms, I'd like to move to one of the key areas of the Simon Scott Center and what it can tell us about the risks in Chad and the Central African Republic or CAR. So launched in 2015 in partnership with Dartmouth College, the Early Warning Project uses quantitative and qualitative methods to assess and spotlight the risks of mass atrocities around the world. The statistical risk assessment, which Elizabeth mentioned, is one of our core components of the early warning project. And the risk assessment allows us to quantitatively forecast the likelihood of a new mass killing in over 160 countries. And it really was developed to uh, be used as an aid to help governments and organizations and individuals really focus time and attention on countries with the highest risk. Our risk assessment specifically focuses on forecasting mass killing, which we define as over a thousand intentional civilian fatalities over a 12 month period perpetrated by a group against another group. And in essence, what the risk assessment is doing is we're using historical instances of mass killing to identify the characteristics of states that help distinguish where and when mass killing is most likely to occur. And then we apply that model to the latest data on countries to produce our annual risk assessment. So where do Chad and Carr rank on our risk assessment? Chad continues to move up our risk list, landing at fourth highest among 162 countries. Our statistical model estimates that there is a 9.2% or approximately a one in 11 chance of a new mass killing beginning in Chad in 2022 or 2023. Chad has consistently ranked in the high risk category, which is rarely our top 30 countries, with fourth marking its highest ranking to date. 
Chad is also one of only three countries in our top 12 that did not have an ongoing mass killing at the end of 2022. So the significance of a new mass killing is high. The Central African Republic ranks 16th highest among 162 countries, and our statistical model estimates that there is a 5% or approximately a 1 in 20 chance of a new mass killing beginning in CAR in 2022 or 2023. And CAR has also ranked in our top 30 since 2020. Since we consider there to be an ongoing mass killing in CAR, this risk estimate that I've mentioned corresponds to a new mass killing occurring, not the continuation or escalation of the ongoing episode. And we see this statistical risk assessment really as a starting point. It can help identify countries that merit more attention, analysis, and potentially preventative action. But other kinds of analyses are necessary to help us identify what exactly would be most effective at, at mitigating risks. Understanding a country's risk of mass killing based on an assessment like our risk assessment should also help inform how we interpret events and developments in that country. In general, observing potential warning signs, including hate speech, should raise greater alarms in a country that is near the top of our rankings than if they're observed in one near the bottom. And while most Cases of mass atrocities are unique and, um, well, all cases of mass atrocities are unique and context specific. They are often preceded by a range of identifiable risk factors and early warning signs. And recognition of these factors and signs can help the world act before violence begins. Especially in countries facing serious risks of mass violence like Chad and Carr, hate speech can be both a warning sign and an instrument of group targeted violence. Before and during mass atrocities, there is often widespread hate speech. Such hate speech can promote the idea that members of a certain group are evil and dangerous. When that speech comes from influential speakers and leaders and is spread through government propaganda or through popular media, it can condition listeners to believe that violence against the, that group is justified. It may also incite some people to commit violence against the group. And efforts to detect and counteract hate speech can actually enhance the efforts to prevent mass atrocities. When designing interventions or approaches to addressing hate speech, in addition to analyzing the speech of particular influential leaders, it's also important to look at a number of other key criteria, including the type of media or platforms that are used, the general context, including the historical context, the targeted audiences, the actual messages and content themselves, and so on. And you can read more about this in our guide on diffusing hate speech, which I believe will be linked in the Q&A and the chat function on the website. And even if you don't think that hate speech itself will cause violence in a specific situation, it can still be a useful warning sign for the risks of violence. Hate speech can be a warning sign if it reflects a situation or causes increased levels of extreme polarization and conflict. For example, in Chad, harmful content circulating on social media may be deepening an increasingly politicized divide between communities with the potential to serve both as a warning sign for group targeted violence and also raises concerns that the nature of hate speech spreading could accelerate violence. And while we don't have the, spe the deep specialization on CAR or CHAD, seeking to understand and monitor the connections between hate speech and atrocities can help practitioners better prevent and address crises. My co-panelists, Yamingye and Rosan, will certainly have a lot more to say on the specific situations in these two countries. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Archie. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Ashley, for the very useful background on, on the risk assessment and, and your insights on the relationship between uh, hate speech and atrocity risks. And um, some of the resources you mentioned have, have been shared in the chat. So we'll be really interested to come back to some of these points in, in a discussion. So thanks again. 
Uh, I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Betinbaye Yaminge. Um, can you speak to how hate speech has played out uh, in the Chadian context o- over the years and, and what have been its main drivers and, and perhaps also touching on some efforts by civil society on the ground to address the, the, this trend? Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity for being able to speak with you about uh, trends in hate speech in Chad. Today, in Chad, most tension um, is uh, present around the political transition that is ongoing. And we are hearing lots of hate speech around this issue. Across the entire country. And it's a big concern for us. We are focused on three points. I would like to speak to you about the current dynamics in my country, especially with regards to hate speech, and how that has changed in recent years. I would also like to speak to you briefly about what we're doing, uh, what Crash is doing to prevent hate speech and to fight back against it. And then I would also like to speak with you about some of the interrelations between hate speech and mass atrocities, uh, which is a real big risk for the security of citizens in the country. And then I would like to end with a few tools that we think are all already available to help us better anticipate and better prevent um, a hate speech in the Chadian context. So, in Chad, in the current socio-political atmosphere, um, there is a great risk of conflict and of violence, and that has been the case since the country gained its independence in 1960. Today, the political context is um, in, in April 2021, the former president, uh, Marshal Idris. Debi, who had just been re-elected for a term of six years as president, was killed uh, in a conflict uh, in, in the Sahara, in the north of the country. The army then took control of national institutions and began a political transition process. The goal was to bring the country back to a stable state. And so the army took over this political transition. And we've seen that in other countries in the Sahel, as in Mali, as in Burkina Faso, as in Guinea, or in Sudan. We've seen similar things. And this transition was planned to be a transition of 18 months, but it had to be extended. At the end of the National Dialogue, which was organized in N'Djamena between August and October 2022, this dialogue focused on a few major actions that had taken place during the 18 months of the transition. And there were consultations with political actors and civil society actors, as well as negotiations with different representatives. This National Dialogue process there were a lot of expectations around it. Chadians had many expectations of this process. And we hoped that it would end in recommendations. Um, some, of, some of the recommendations that it ended in were quite unpopular, namely the extension of the transition period to 24 months and also certain people were not allowed to participate in the elections that were planned for the end of the process. After the national dialogue, various actors from civil society who were not happy, as well as the political opposition, called for um, mass demonstrations in October 2022. These demonstrations against uh, were violently repla- repressed by the security forces. And there were up to 128 people who died during these uh, protests. And then there were mass arrests, mass imprisonments, all in the name of security. After these 
uh, manifestations which were violently repre repressed, uh, representatives of the civil, of civil society and the political opposition had to leave for exile or had to hide within the country. And so the political space became more and more closed and closed off within Chad. Now, there is almost no political debate in the country, but there's a lot of frustration. There are a lot of people who are unhappy, who have grievances with the way the situation has been managed. The result is that political debate has moved from physical spaces into virtual spaces. And these virtual spaces have been completely flooded with content that expresses these frustrations, that expresses these grievances, this anger that is present within the country. However, these actions have had consequences that go beyond the realm of politics. In Chad, we have seen an amplification, uh, uh, increasing tensions in between political groups. At CRASH, we monitor these kinds of tensions. And we have documented around 27 different conflicts with a minimum of 200 deaths across them in 2022. And the, perhaps as many as 455 deaths in 2022. And only in the first quarter of 2023, there have been 11 major conflicts with around 120, 125 people who have died. So the tensions are there. There's a lot of frustration with the political situation. And as a consequence, and there is more and more hate speech being spread, especially in social media. Within Crash, we are doing our best to try to understand and fight back against this phenomenon of hate speech. And so we did a study on how this hate speech is spread, how that works. We've also organized various workshops with civil society organizations and media organizations. And we just held a regional seminar which brought together um, Chadian actors and also people from the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of the Congo so that we could all share our experiences in terms of preventing and fighting back against hate speech. All of these efforts that we have uh, put forth within CRASH have started bearing their fruit. In Chad, we have seen a rise in the spread of hate speech after the demonstrations in October 2022, but the hateful messages, the content, focuses on identity issues, things like ethnicity, religion, gender, class, age. All of these aspects of identity are used to exclude and put down certain groups and certain people. There are clear links between hate speech and violence in Chad and, and the risk of mass violence. In Chad, we have these hate speech, which is present in social media, and it contributes directly to greater mobilization, for example, during the protests in October 2022. And this hate speech can target specific people, specific groups, or can call for community-based violence. And, you know, there, as many other places, we have the conflicts between uh, herdsmen and farmers. And this has been a source for producing and spreading hate speech content that targets certain identity groups or that calls for violence against these groups. So this kind of content calls for violence, calls for hate, promotes hate, and promotes a, a divisions based on identity. We estimate that the government in Chad can do something to calm down the socio-political context, but 
par exemple, euh, faire un plaidoyer au, auprès du gouvernement tchadien. It is also up to us to advocate for the end to this violence with the government. We need the representatives of the transition to be responsible, to be inclusive. We need the political transition to be a transition that truly focuses on the trends that are present within our country. This is a great challenge. And we, the civil society is there to do it, but we need support, we need support from the media, and we need specific mechanisms that will identify and fight back against hate speech. And within CRASH, we're doing research towards this end, and we have observed that with fact-checking, if we were able to better develop our fact-checking tools and abilities, um, and better fact-check the media and civil society organizations, that could help limit how much hate speech is amplified and passed along. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Yaminge, for, for these remarks. I, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rosan uh, for some of his observations on, on hate speech dynamics and how they play out in the Central African Republic. Um, so, Rosan, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. My partners, guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am very happy to be participating in this event with you, which will have a great impact on peace and security for citizens in my country. Just as in many other countries in the world, hate speech has led to conflict in the Central African Republic. And it's something that is happening every day. Our country has a great diversity of languages, cultures, ethnicities, and even if we share a national language called Songo, we are also living in a very difficult social, economic, political context. Today, the Central African Republic is one of the most impacted countries by hate speech. It has led to much conflict. The citizens of the Central African Republic have realized that disinformation and hate speech is a big problem. And this is true, especially since the elections that were held in December 2020. However, it is evolution um, we must recognize that there are dynamics that contribute to this hate speech and disinformation. Over the last, in recent years, we have seen some political projects from, on, from the part of the president and others that have tried to increase security and understanding amongst the population, but some of these initiatives have been called unconstitutional by intellectuals in the country. I'll give you an example. One of these projects was the plan to start using cryptocurrency, or there was another plan uh, to have a constitutional referendum to change the constitution of the country, not to mention the presence of the Wagner Group and Rwandan soldiers in the Central African Republic. In my country, we are seeing again and again hate speech that leads to conflict and lots of disinformation as well. We see this on social media, in WhatsApp groups, within different communities, in all kinds of public spaces, especially um, uh, in the run-up to the constitutional referendum that was held on June 30th, 2023 uh, by President Atwadera. Hate speech and disinformation have been spread by uh, people who support the referendum, who call themselves progressives, as well as members of political groups who do not support the referendum. And I'm not sure if you know, but hate speech and disinformation 
are a real and present threat and danger for the safety and security of citizens in the Central African Republic. They, there can be a lot of harm done to people, to their feelings, to the victims of this hate speech. Also, in various communities and in the country as a whole, hate speech and disinformation have become a plague, a scourge at the national level, but also at the international level. And this hate speech is uh, making the climate of division even worse and leading to violence, to exclusion. And to all kinds of divisions, cultural divisions, professional divisions. In order to better understand hate speech and disinformation at the local level, we have put forth many different kinds of efforts along with our partners, such as USIP. Many efforts have been undertaken in order to to counter hate speech. We have had the strong strategies that were developed by at the local level, and many efforts have been undertaken, and the results are visible and are concrete in Central Africa. We are talking here about the protection of lexicon and terms, and of course, it's considered to be a tool today, indispensable for communication. And it is among communities, uh, and it is used. We have had also the mobilization of leaders, community leaders, leaders um, of uh, communities, and the members of the parties have been involved. We've had media and professionals, and we've had members of the government have been mobilized in this struggle and prevention of hate speech that is uh, that is that creates misinformation and tension we've had like workshops of training that have been organized among the groups and in order to fight against hate speech and misinformation at the local level uh, uh, partners or Juventus and partners have organized public campaigns uh, or radio waves on the to reduce the risk of uh, speech, uh, hate speech, mis in order to reduce mistrust uh, among community, inter-religious and inter-conflict uh, read uh, like. Uh, I would like to continue today to work directly with um, community leaders. Uh, and, and of course, the, those of the third arrondissement of Bangui. And another significant impact of those actions and its partners in the fight against hate speech and misinformation is seen today through a platform of actors. Uh, bloggers, journalists that have worked together in order to counter hate speech. It is a network that is organized uh, from uh, journalists and uh, online media to uh, counter hate speech in Central Africa. And to conclude, given the context of the referendum and its agendas, it is obvious at the, uh, at the, that given all the efforts that were undertaken, it is very sad and regrettable to admit that there are still today very high risks of hate speech, of uh, misinformation that creates, uh, of course, divisions and that leads the African community to enter a new cycle, new cycle of violence clashes among communities, inter-community, and even inter-religious. That would, and this is not a good thing because we, it is urgent to intervene by major preventive actions in order to uh, counter uh, these conflicts. So we see that this is something very important. A pleasure to thank you very sincerely, not only for your usual co collaboration, but also for your 
various and support and unconditional support and wavering support for the peace and security of the civilian populations in my country, the Central African Republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosan, for these insightful remarks, uh, notably on, on the grassroots and, and coalition efforts to, to tackle hate speech uh, really at its core. And I'd like to, to come back to you as well as Yaminge for, for, some, for some questions. Um, we will also soon move to a question and answer session with members of the audience. Uh, before then, uh, I'd like to ask a few follow-up questions uh, for the panelists. Um, starting with you, Ashley, if that's okay. Um, you spoke about hate speech as both an instrument um, uh, for violence and an early warning sign. Um, given observations from uh, Yaminge and Rosan on the evolution of hate speech in, in both Chad and Carr, could you reflect on, on this, this notion of hate speech as a potential tool for mobilization in these contexts? And uh, you know, whether hate speech can also be a risk factor for mass violence uh, where it becomes normalized, maybe alongside other variables? Um, and if so, you know, how can it be better tracked, analyzed, understood, and, and integrated in our understanding? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Archie. Uh, happy to hopefully provide some comments on those. Um, but yeah, I would be interested to hear uh, Yuminge and Rosan's um, insights as well. But yeah, first, just to say, of course, that hate speech can certainly mobilize people to take violent action. Um, it's, of course, important to note that it doesn't always motivate people. Um, so you need other factors as well that need to be present, which is why, of course, examining the whole situation and the context and the other factors at play um, is also important. But it definitely can, hate speech can mobilize groups just in itself, in the content and the messages. Um, but as um, others have mentioned, it could also be used by certain actors to strategically mobilize support. Um, so it's important to, to watch out for that when it's being manipulated and used by certain uh, influential leaders um, and so on. But the significant thing why it is so important for um, why it can mobilize people is that what it does is hate speech can really make violence seem not only acceptable, which is powerful powerful in itself, but also it can seem, it can frame it as being necessary and even legitimate. So ultimately hate speech can really provide people with the, um, re and research has shown this, with the sort of necessary motiva motivation, leg legitimization and rationalization to actually commit violence. Um, and there are a number of reasons why this is. Um, hate, hateful speech can really frame the other or the out group as outside of our moral community and therefore not deserving of moral consideration. I um, mean, it does this by referring to the out group as, say, less than human. And of course, that's where you get these dehumanization uh, terms and language that's used. Um, for example, in uh, Myanmar, Burma, um, the, the term dogs was used um, against the Rohingya community. Um, it can also frame uh, the outgroup as foreigners who might not belong in that area and so are, again, outside of our community. Um, but there is a fairly sort of dangerous and significant point when the outgroup is framed as a threat and a threat that needs to be dealt with. Um, this often perceived and imagined threat can instill fear that that other is going to attack and take over in some way. And so therefore it encourages people or can encourage people to go on the offense and attack first. Um, and oftentimes um, this leads to uh, messages that are sort of calls to action, as I think um, Yaminga mentioned as well, um, and using sort of language of revenge, um, you know, in referring to a past injustice um, or even purity language, sort of likening um, people to a disease or a pest that needs to be cleansed or removed. Um, and that we saw in Rwanda when uh, Tutsis were referred to as cockroaches or even in the Holocaust um, when Jews were referred to as rats. Um, but then ultimately this can actually lead to direct incitements to violence, which we have seen in some cases on social media where there are explicit um, incitements to attack 
specific people in at a specific time at a specific place and this is where it really becomes a, a tool an instrument for violence um, and yeah important to note that even weaker levels of endorsement and internalization of these sorts of beliefs and attitudes is enough to motivate people to indirectly or uh, directly participate in violence. Um, and you'll see that in various atrocity frameworks like the US government's atrocity framework and the UN's atrocity framework, it really is hate speech is um, illustrated as this motivating tool. You'll often find it in sections that are labeled as incentives or means and really showing you that perpetrators often rely on hate speech to mobilize um, people to attack civilians. Um, I'll just briefly hopefully talk about some of the other questions you asked. Uh, uh, as a risk factor. And I'll obviously preface this again by saying that hate speech alone is likely not going to lead to genocide um, or mass atrocities. So other factors will usually be present as well. Um, but you can see hate speech at all stages. You can see it as a, in um, risk factors. You can see it in early warning signs. And then, of course, as triggers and accelerants. Um, and then again, as a tool. Um, the most commonly acknowledged, uh, well, one of the most commonly acknowledged risk factors is ideology. Um, spe specifically exclusionary ideology, which is a belief system that justifies efforts to persecute or eliminate certain groups of people. Um, this tends to usually be political in some way and tends to be espoused by leaders. So hate speech can play a role by contributing to this risk factor, um, and leaders might be the ones driving the exclusionary ideology through their hateful rhetoric. Um, but oftentimes those leaders will pull from the pre-existing ideas and views that are held by a society. So the importance of hate speech among a population um, is, is also key um, as well. But yes, as you've mentioned, um, you know, like our statistical risk assessment, we include a variety of variables into the risk assessment. Um, because our model is learning from the past in order to forecast the likelihood of a new mass killing in the future, um, we really need, we have, you know, strict criteria on our data that we're able to include, and it really needs to go back far enough and to cover many countries over 160, as I've mentioned. Um, so at this point, it's difficult for us and other organizations to include variables on hate speech, um, which I think others have mentioned too. It's a very hard um, variable to measure and track. Um, but the ideal scenario would be that, yes, um, one would eventually establish a, path, a platform that could measure countries and their uh, hate speech. And then if we're able to sort of track that and monitor it over time, you could see shifts and changes in a society's level of um, endorsement or acceptability of uh, these views as well. But uh, it is um, integrated in a lot of atrocity uh, assessment frameworks, as I've mentioned, um, the US government's framework and the UN's framework. Um, and we use it, of course, in our deep dive analyses that we do on countries. But the more we can build out this and the more we can better understand how hate speech um, operates and how it connects to mass atrocities, the better those uh, risk assessments are going to be. Um, so data is so key and so needed needed. Um, the more data that we can produce, like and especially from these local organizations um, that Yaminge and um, Rosana from, uh, the better that's going to be. If it can be public data and produced, we'll be able to improve our risk assessments um, and so on. But uh, hopefully I've covered most of your questions, Archie. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'd like to ask Yaminge if you had any reactions on on, on these really useful remarks, and um, you know, especially the the comment on the notion of outgroup as threats and exclusionary ideology. And I wondered if you could elaborate on on some findings, perhaps from the recent uh, social media study. Are there like illustrative, recurring messages that you've seen in, in chat, and to what extent do young populations? internalize these messages that are that are vehicled on, on these different platforms. Ok, merci beaucoup Arsi. Je crois que le réseau internet est relativement mauvais. 
The study has allowed us to do a lot. We've had the spread of content, and we've had like that during the transition period. So one of the conclusions that we've we've reached. But also, we've had the conclusion. We've had a, a reinforcement and amplification of, uh, of course, of hate speech after the national dialogue and, uh, of course, after the protest, pro protests of uh, October 20th. And as Ashley said, very clear, starting from that moment and starting from uh, October 2022, these, uh, the hate speech, were very prominent. And we've also observed, in addition to that, uh, of course, the re reinforcement of a certain uh, hate, reinforcement of hate speech from uh, from uh, leaders, political leaders, uh, also community has been involved. So we've had inter-communities who, uh, who have the power of, we have communities that ha were targeted by the power. So this reinforced this division and we've had uh, at the political level and community level. I would like here insist upon the fact that what was, was observed during the national dialogue and uh, since the uh, protests of October 2022 was that this migrated the public public uh, space towards the virtual public so we've seen hate speech we've seen we've seen factors of risks that uh, that perturb peace and uh, and of course we've had during this uh, we've had certain things that were manifest during this period. For example, there was a vague of uh, conflicts and intercommunity uh, tension during the last uh, months. Uh, social media through a number of uh, hate content have been mobilized to reinforce those mobilizations uh, in, in the community. The study allowed us to realize that in terms of uh, of uh, of hate speech we've noticed that there are platforms that have been developed and uh, let's uh, that's the case of facebook and it it's like a lab a hate lab it's a, facebook has been considered like a hate lab and we've seen that this is within the dynamic of uh, spreading this hate speech. so the first factor that we've noticed is that this functions like a group of uh, of a selection of uh, members uh, that are close to one another and that that know each other, that have selected one another. Second, is that we've seen that there is this usage of, uh, of certain ter terms and the use of uh, certain terminology. This created, this means that we can spread some content and, and we've had manifestation of a certain speech. So we say, so people that know each other say, we are between us and we can really say things among us. And this reinforces this uh, risks of mobilization for mass violence in terms of recommendation or in terms of, uh, of advice. Uh, you've mentioned several recommendations. I think a pedagogical work has should be undertaken among the civil society, among the media is necessary. We can move towards the sense and we can very well look at this logic. We, logic, we can look at a content that is elaborated and that can be, for example, uh, set up in cooperation with, uh, with the certain groups. It's very important to sensitize uh, actors like religious leaders or traditional communities in order to, inter to intervene and help to inverse the tendency. We see that the judicial tendency is very important as well, the legal. The, we estimate that. Uh, so if the bearers of hate speech are present and are there, uh, we need to do something about it. They can be identified, they have to be prosecuted, they have to be condemned, and they have to be, uh, of course, arrested. This is very important. This reinforces uh, the legal framework 
Uh, and we see that this is something very important. We need a track also. Tracking is very important. We can identify through tracking uh, and shed light on those leaders, hate speech leaders, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, try to let the Association for Human Rights uh, say something about it. This is very important, and that uh, can inverse the tendency. Now, in terms of research, uh, I can say that there are so many things that we can say. Uh, we can uh, certainly work together with Ashley, we can work with uh, other groups uh, uh, regarding the chat. We do a lot of research. So the factor of research is very important. It's useful to do case studies, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, if in, in the case of intercommunity tensions, we've observed that uh, uh, that mobilization of hate speech is uh, uh, undertaken uh, in different ways. Uh, there are nuances that we have to understand in the context of case studies, and this will understand to uh, b help us to better understand those tendencies. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Yaminge. Um, Rosan, I'd like to turn to you as, as a key civil society leader and activist in the Central African Republic and the region. Um, you know, you've really taken on this fight against hate speech um, at the local level. And, um, you know, what, what do you make of all this uh, from, from the conceptual issues to the local level? What are the necessary ingredients to effectively combat or tackle hate speech and from the local to the national policy level in CAR, for example? And what are the key partnerships that need to be built for this work to be successful? Thanks. Uh, Rosa, are you are you with us? Were you able to hear the question? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. I heard the question. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. First, I think it's important to understand that it, right now it's a very sensitive situation in the Central African Republic. Why? Because we have just had this constitutional referendum. Imagine that, you know, you have the people of the country who has been divided into two groups that are antagonistic, the one towards the other. And this plan for a constitutional referendum has divided the people. And since we have a very low level of education in general in the country, it's easy for people to use manipulation tactics. And, uh, but so, you know, there's this referendum going on, but given people's poverty and low level of education, they don't necessarily have the tools to uh, properly interpret the information they're hearing. And there's a lot of hate speech coming out um, from both sides. And we believe that we need to work on communicating better and communicating better with the population and helping the community be aware of what's going on. We need to involve all parts of the population, including people with disabilities, different religious groups, men, women, we need to involve everyone in our communication efforts so that we can better fight against hate speech altogether within the Central African Republic. I would also like to ask, use it, and I would like to focus in on the point that um, with better civil education, um, that's what we need. We need to develop antibodies within the, the body politic of the country against hate speech. And if we can connect actions for peace, 
you know, with other initiatives to support agriculture, for example. That's something that would have a, a positive effect. And maybe for people who don't have any f access to financial resources, they are more likely to turn um, to hate speech if they're looking for resources and someone who's putting out hate speech is able to provide them with those resources. And then there's also the question of cross-border instability. The border with Chad, it's a complicated situation right now. And all around the Central African Republic, we also have the DRC and other bordering countries where there are other conflicts going on. And so as we study the risk of hate speech, we need to look at the cross-border effects as well. That's what we're doing with my organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosan. Um, very, very useful. And we also, I noticed that you touched on cross-border dynamics. It looks like we had a question in the chat around regional dynamics of hate speech with Sudan. Um, and perhaps we can get to that um, with, with Yaminge. But first, you know, moving moving to the Q&A now, um, feel free to ask questions in, in English or French uh, using the Q&A function uh, to our members of the audience. We have one question on the linkages between hate speech and disinformation. And um, are there differences between the two or are they, do they become intermingled? So let, let's see if uh, maybe Yaminge and Ashley could take that. Um, and then we'll have another question prepared. Thanks. Maybe starting with Yaminge, if you had thoughts on the disinformation hate speech links. Okay, maybe maybe the, the connection is slow. I can um, see if Ashley, um, if, if you had any reactions on that, how are uh, hate speech and disinformation linked or not? Is there overlap between the two? Yes, certainly I can I can start um, if it makes sense. Um, so yes, I think Elizabeth mentioned it in the beginning, um, just that there can definitely be overlap between hate speech um, and disinformation and misinformation. Um, and I think building on something that Yaminge said actually, um, and also something Roseanne said about the manipulation. So specifically disinformation and misinformation can be used to manipulate and uh, instill fear and create um, these false ideas of an outgroup. So for instance, they could spread messages that an outgroup um, was saying something or doing something or had done something. And we can also see that disinformation and misinformation can be seen now in videos and images as well. So that has the potential to be very dangerous. So when, um, as Rosan said, when we don't have enough training, um, digital literacy training, of training to understand um, when something might be fake, um, when it might be uh, misinformation, that can really be dangerous as it can yeah, foster a, a false image um, of the either the situation itself or an outgroup um, as well. So I think I'll I'll leave it at that and hopefully Yaminge can um, expand on that. Thank, thanks, Ashley. Uh, Yaminge, if you wanted to expand on that, uh, especially with the recent social media study um, and the linkages between hate speech and information, and if you also wanted to take this opportunity for any reflections on the question regarding Sudan. So do you feel there is a role of hate speech playing in Sudan's current conflict? And um, I, I know obviously with the developments between the two countries, there may be some insights that you could share on, on the link between the Sudan war and the Chad context. Yeah, Minge, did you manage to see that question? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I was having a bit of a connection issue, but I'm here now. To answer your question, in, especially with regard to Chad, disinformation is often 
a catalyst for hate speech. And people get involved. They, they, on purpose, they, they start spreading false information on purpose. Why? Um, uh, uh, to target people who belong to a specific identity group or ethnic group. And the goal is to produce and to spread hateful content. So that's the connection between the two. If we can reduce the amount of disinformation um, in out there in Chad, that will go a long way to reducing the transmission of hateful content as well, I think. Great, thank you, Yaminge. Um, I wondered if, like on the question regarding Sudan, um, I, I believe there were some recent findings uh, in Chad around the impact of the Sudan war on some communities um, in Chad. And if you could speak to disinformation hate speech regarding the Sudan conflict, uh, if you had a few few thoughts on that as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that I've got the question. Um, so, I get, so the question um, that I have uh, using a question from the chat here is, how does the Sudan conflict and the, Su the war in Sudan currently, how does that play out? How does disinformation and hate speech play out in the Chadian context, especially in Eastern Chad, for example? Can you speak about the effect of the Sudan war on this information space in Chad? Yes, of course. Um, there is a big influence, especially in the eastern part of Chad. There's a big influence. For example, recently in Abeche, which is very close to Sudan, um, there are similar communities on both sides of the border, and people who belong to the same ethnic group, the same you know, the same identity groups on both sides of the border. And what's going on in Sudan today? And this was the same thing that happened in the 2010s, has a direct impact on Sudan because of these affinities, these connections that cross the border. And often, people say, oh, I'm for or against this politician, this general. And that kind of, you know, becomes part of the general public opinion. But in the east and the north of Chad, there are many armed groups, rebellious groups. And, you know, many of them have never come and sat around the negotiation table with the government. And they have links with the groups that are fighting in Sudan. So even groups fighting, uh, armed groups, there's connections across the border. And so the government has tried to close the border, but this conflict, which is taking place mostly in Sudan, is having spillover effects. And there's lots of in incorrect information that's being spread around. There are even WhatsApp groups that have been created. And the members of these groups, you know, they're pro this figure or anti that figure. And that's the, what brings them together in the WhatsApp group. And this way, with social media, it actually contributes to greater conflict. It, it stirs up people's sentiments. I'm sorry, it seems we have lost the connection. Okay, I think we, we have another question in the chat um, for that I think we can ask Rosan. Um, so the question is focused on trainings. And I wondered, uh, Rosan, uh, if you could speak about the types of training topics uh, or programs that are useful in preparing communities to respond to hate speech. Uh, are there are topics like empathy and nonviolence useful? or other topics that are useful? Uh, 
Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour, uh, Thank you very much for your question. There are a lot of different themes that we focus on. And what helps a community live together better? That's really the big question. And the interpreter would like to excuse himself. There seem to be some connection issues. Yes. We need a civil response to these issues. We need to think about it at, in terms of civil society. Okay. Thank you, Rosa. I think Désolé. we lost you. Yeah. Désolé. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. So, yes, civic education, civic, civics education is incredibly important. And many of the politicians in our country, they are able to, they say that they want to educate the people, but they really want to keep them in their ignorance, because that makes them easier to manipulate. And so we need to focus on civics education, not only in um, schools, but also in cultural institutions and churches. And I think that that is something that uh, will advance the transformation and help people become more aware and hopefully better protect peace. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosan, for, for this. And uh, we have another question uh, in the chat around the shifting trends in hate speech in uh, Central Africa. Um, I think you both addressed this in your uh, opening remarks, but I'd like to ask Yaminge uh, a follow-up question on this. Uh, um, who are the most widely circulated producers of this speech? Um, and which groups are the most vulnerable in Chad? So I think you touched a bit on this, but if you wanted to elaborate on, on the main actors and targets, Yes. In general, the producers of this hate speech are mostly young people and especially young students in high school and in university, also politicians and political leaders. We have been able to show that there are two levels of authors, there's two levels of groups that are producing this hate speech. Some are doing it voluntarily, others involuntarily. And it depends on, you know, what they say depends on which group they belong to. When you have a political leader, for example, when they make a certain statement, that can lead to a whole cascade of other comments that are made. And people say, oh, this politician said this, said that, and that means this or that. And then there are also major, some major producers of hateful content in Chad. And then the people who are targeted are especially people who come from minority groups. Over the last 30 years in Chad, State power has been head, was held by uh, Marshal Deby. And at his death, when the political transition began, his son was designated transition president. And, and, uh, and uh, opponents to this political power are often targeted by hate speech. And we have recurring conflicts that, you know, target uh, Fulani or Arab herders at the expense of other farmer groups. But, and so you have, you know, Arab and Fulani groups that are regularly targeted by hate speech. That's a big problem that we have. And I hope I've answered your question there.
Thanks, Yaminge. Uh, yeah, that was that was very clear uh, and useful to have that granularity indeed. Um, I'd like to come back to Ashley, uh, perhaps on the on the training question in, um, you know, from from the, from your perspective and where you sit, uh, both as an expert and a, and a practitioner, what are the types of, of training topics that that are useful um, and questions around empathy and so forth. Um, and also would love to see if you had further ideas or, or key takeaways from the diffusing hate speech guide um, that you mentioned that was shared in the chat related to, to this question too. Great. Yeah, happy to um, help um, yeah, provide some info on that. So definitely, um, the question that we received earlier on empathy and um, sort of nonviolent training as well, that's absolutely um, important and necessary and programs that are designed more along those lines, you know, whether it's yeah, trying to uh, bridge connections and social cohesion between communities um, are always very important. I know they've, for instance, done um, actual work on the ground uh, where um, you'll make the connection as to what what the human impact or the human consequences of hate speech was to various groups. So they'll actually send these sort of direct messages to people who are um, espousing hate speech and show them, you know, what was the consequence? How did it make people pe feel? Um, so those have shown some success as well, but definitely the social cohesion, bringing groups together. Um, as Yaminge mentioned, you know, a lot of the time people might be um, putting out hate speech or um, might it might appeal to them because it's creating this community, this belonging, as Yaminge mentioned. And so it's important for us when we're designing interventions to try to re reduce hate speech that we actually create you know, other types of communities and safe spaces um, where people feel like they can um, come and leave um, the sort of communities that might be radicalizing them. Um, I, I will say the other sort of the types of interventions which Rosan has um, very clearly articulated are these um, training efforts and especially trainings to influential uh, speakers. And those might be influencers. So those might be, as Rosan mentioned, blog um, or journalists and, and so on. And when you are designing interventions to um, reduce hate speech and trying to teach people um, how to do it, you really are, and this is in our diffusing um, hate speech guide, you're trying to design inter interventions that aim to reduce the likelihood that audiences will accept or spread the speech, um, also reducing the likelihood that audiences will condone or participate in group targeted violence. Um, and then um, also something Yamenge said as well, but increase the willingness among audience members to speak out against hate speech um, and group targeted violence. And that can obviously be a, a tricky thing because groups might be at risk, but the more people in positions of power as well can speak out um, against uh, hate speech is important. But yes, I really would encourage people to take a look at the Diffusing Hate Speech Guide as it really can walk you through um, how to better understand the context that hate speech is in, but also um, to design uh, interventions that might work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ashley, for this. Um, I, I'd like to see if Perhaps maybe Elizabeth had any reactions to, uh, on this discussion or maybe some key takeaways um, or insights from, from the conversation that you'd like to share on um, reaction to um, you know, remarks from the field and, and from Ashley um, bef before we start wrapping up. Sure, absolutely. So I, I can share some closing remarks now, just some, some general points as well. Um, in in response to the question of what what types of um, what types of topics what types of interventions are most useful, I've been struck um, during our, our years of partnership um, with Ajemadek and our more recent partnerships with Crash that this the our partners' interventions are so strong because they respond to very local dynamics. And I think this is what Ashley was getting at um, the the partnership. Um, not just with um, civil society at the provincial or prefecture level, but very local civil society at the community level allows for a response that is appropriate 
to the very, very specific ways that hate speech um, can differ from community to community. So uh, I, I admire that our partners are always consulting with the, the beneficiaries and community leaders and designing responses that really respond to their needs and allowing them in turn to, to take any training or capacity building that they might receive from, from Crash or Gemadec and then create very local projects, reaching out to, to communities on their own terms, so to speak. So I think that that, that local dimension, we have to, we have to resist the, the idea that we can have a one-size-fits-all approach and really um, trying to respond to, to, to local realities and local leaders um, makes these interventions most effective. I found, I'll say just very briefly, a few closing points. I, I found this conversation um, today uh, so informative, um, very, very sobering and very energizing at the same time. I, I was struck by, um, by the discussion of hate speech um, and its impacts as contributing not only to, uh, to being a risk factor for violence, but also contributing to long-term exclusion, which I think... Um, I think speaks to the fact that um, our efforts to counter hate speech are important not only um, to, to, to prevent acute um, and, and very deadly episodes of violence, but to work against the, the long-term exclusive patterns that have kept certain groups of citizens on the outside. Uh, so I think that uh, countering hate speech, in short, has a role in, uh, can help us to promote more inclusive governance. And on that same vein, um, I, I think that it's very important to bring these excluded groups into the forefront of efforts to counter and respond to hate speech. It is much harder to spread a false rumor about a, a targeted group, say um, Fulani, when you see Fulani leaders who are actively working to counter hate speech. So I think having excluded groups at the forefront of efforts to counter hate speech and to lead peace, peace building um, it can, can be very effective here. I thought uh, Hosan's point on holistic interventions, antibodies, as he said, was so important. Um, Ashley mentioned digital liter literacy training. Um, Hosan mentioned that we have to train people to consume information, um, to be responsible, um, to receive information responsibly, to know how to respond to it. So holistic interventions are, are, are quite important. Um, lastly, I'll say that I'm, I'm very glad that we have included Central African Republic and, and Chad in this conversation together because the dimensions really are regional. Um, Yaminge really spoke articulately to the ways in which the Sudan conflict is exacerbating hate speech um, in Chad. And so I, I hope that Future conversations can, can broaden even beyond uh, this subregion um, because this is truly a, a, a problem that does not respect borders. Um, so consequently, I think that our, our analysis and our interventions should, should span borders as well. Uh, I'm so grateful to, to Ashley, to Yeminge, to Hosan for, for their partnership, um, for their outstanding work. And it's, it's been an honor to, to, to co-sponsor uh, this event with the Holocaust Memorial Museum and to have our esteemed partners Crash and Ajemadek present with us today. Thanks, Elizabeth. And also thanks uh, to members of the audience, really, for, for some really great questions as well. Um, I, I wondered if perhaps, um, Ashley, you had some, some parting thoughts uh, following Elizabeth's uh, remarks. Yes, thank you. It has been a yeah, great pleasure. Um, I've learned a lot, so very happy to be here. Um, but yeah, just three quick remarks. Um, just want to stress the importance of obviously learning from past instances where hate speech went unheeded. And of course, from where I'm coming from, the Holocaust can serve as a prime example of this. Um, but then secondly, also the importance of early warning efforts, um, like everyone here is doing today. Um, hate speech can often be one of the first and early warning signs that something is escalating. So just stressing that importance of doing this early warning work and these intervention efforts and programs is so important. And then just finally echoing something that Elizabeth said, but the importance of including local communities, that local communities are really, um, they're, you know, doing the heavy lifting here and providing the rich nuanced details for us um, and the importance of including vulnerable groups 
um, like women and stuff in these and uh, especially at risk uh, communities in these conversations. But yes, it really is civil society groups that are doing um, some of the best work there. So the more we can support their efforts, uh, the better. But yeah, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. so much, uh, Ashley and all. This was a great discussion. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that this was the end of the event. So um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye.